This episode is brought to you by my fertility awareness programs. Master fertility awareness and improve your menstrual cycle health at the same time. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information. That's fertilityfriday.com slash work with me. This is the Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 180. Welcome to the 180th episode of the Fertility Friday podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm Lisa from fertilityfriday.com, and this is your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. For those of you who are relatively new to charting your cycles with fertility awareness, and also for those of you who've been charting for a while and have some experience under your belt, I have something special for you. I've created a free video series, and I've called it Fertility Awareness 101. Now in this video series, what I'm going through with you is what is fertility awareness? What is body literacy? Something that I always talk about because it's not just about charting, it's also about what you can learn about your body and your health from your charts. I go through the three main fertile signs and also how to get started with charting. What do you need to make it work? (laughs) And what resources, what are the best resources to help you on your journey as you get started? So for more information, head over to fertilityfriday.com slash fam 101. That's fertilityfriday.com slash F-A-M 101 to get your free copy. I'm excited to share today's episode with you. In today's show, I have Dr. Laura Bryden. Now, Dr. Bryden was one of my very first guests that I interviewed on the show. I interviewed her back in episode number seven. So if you are new to the show and you haven't had a chance to listen back that far, I would highly recommend for you to go back and listen to episode seven if you haven't, because it's it's actually a very powerful episode and it's one that I've referenced many times throughout the, the years that have passed since then. I also had Dr. Bryden back in episode 86 and we spoke about hypothalamic amenorrhea. And in today's episode, we're actually tackling dysmenorrhea. So we're tackling painful periods, endometriosis, because it's often related to painful periods, and really getting at why it happens and what are some of the things that you can do about it, what are some of the things to look for. It's really the episode that I wish I had listened to when I was 16 or 17, because from my very first period, I had extremely painful periods, as many of you know, who've listened to the show. And so the knowledge and information contained in this interview would have really helped me (laughs) in my 20s, while I was still trying to figure all of this stuff out. And in today's episode, you know, we're talking about managing period pain, uh, what some of the strategies are that Laura uses with her clients. Now, just as a reminder, the information presented in this episode is not intended to replace medical advice. It is not intended as medical advice. It's just for informational purposes only. If you do find that you are experiencing painful periods or other types of challenges, You'll want to consult with a health professional and ultimately you'll get the best results when you're working with a skilled practitioner. So whether you're brand new to the fertility awareness method and you're learning how to chart, how to observe your fertile signs, how to figure out what's happening with your cervical mucus and your basal body temperature and all of the different signs and and notations that come along with fertility awareness charting, or whether you're more experienced and you've been charting your cycles for a while, but you still have a couple specific questions around whether it's mucus charting, basal body temperature charting, cervical position, or even just interpretation. So maybe you're really comfortable with putting everything down, but you're not really sure what's happening with your cycles and you're wanting some insight as to what it all means. So wherever you fall on that spectrum, I have a number of programs to support you through that. So if you head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me, you'll see a list of the different programs that I offer. So whether you are fairly confident with the charting aspect and you're just wanting to have one session with me where we really go in, check your menstrual cycle charts, uh, go through them together, and you have an opportunity to ask all of your questions and really get some clarity about what's happening with your cycles, or whether you're looking for a more in-depth understanding of charting where we actually go through several sessions together where we go through the charting, we actually review your charts and leave you feeling really confident in using this method, whether you're using it for birth control or looking to optimize your chances of conception. So wherever you fall on that spectrum, 
make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information about my programs and also what to do. So the next steps, if you're not sure which program is going to be the best fit for you, you can also set up a 15 minute consultation with me where we can really go through and figure out which is the best uh, fit. So without further ado, let's hop into today's episode with Dr. Laura Bryden. And today, I'm very excited to welcome my guest, Laura Bryden, to the show. Laura is a naturopathic doctor with 20 years experience in women's health. And this is her record, her third appearance on the podcast. So I'm really excited to have her back on the show. Laura, I just want to congratulate you on the release of the newest edition of your book, Period Repair Manual, which I'm holding in my hands right now. So without further ado, (laughs) welcome to the show, Laura. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for having me again. I'm excited to be here. Of course. I love having you on the show. And I'm excited today. In today's show, we're going to be talking about period pain. And that's a topic that I've had quite a few questions about. And I realize I haven't really done a specific episode on that for a very long time. So I'm excited to have you here to talk about some of those topics. For sure. Yep. Well, and before we jump right in, I I just wanted to ask you a little bit about your new book, because I know you released the first edition of the manual, the period repair manual. I think it was shortly after we recorded our first interview together. Yeah. Yeah. That was back in 2015. And so that did so well, basically. I got so much great feedback and also just so many, you know, comments and suggestions that I decided to less than three years later dive in and do it again and greatly expand it. I think I think it's something crazy like 300 more additional references compared to the first edition and also I was so lucky I'm over the moon about this professor of endocrinology endocrinology professor Geraldine Pryor help me with this book. She had some input, you know, she read the manuscript, she made some suggestions. I've quoted her in a number of places in the book and she did a forward. So she, her contribution is, I think, quite important for this edition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that is, that's incredible. And so it's definitely, yeah, I think that it's, you did, did an amazing job and it, it's more than just kind of a book. It'll always be more than that in the sense that it's also a great resource. Like it's, yeah. it's something that you can buy and you can kind of hang on to and refer back to. You know what? I'll share something. I, I use it that way. So because it's sort of a compilation of all different references that I've come across, I'll often just as a shorthand, rather than looking in my citations list on my computer, I'll just like flip to the book. It's like, oh, yeah, what was that reference for PMS or that reference for endometriosis, that new one? And I, it's a handy way to find those as well. So let's jump into the topic of the day. Period pain mm. is a huge topic, and ultimately mm. that could be the topic of its own book. But I suppose a, a question to to get our feet wet and get us into it, I just want to ask you, how common is period pain? How how common is it in your practice? Yeah, well, obviously very common. So I think the estimates are something crazy, like 90% of women will experience some pain with their period at some time in their life. So it's kind of, it's considered to be almost, standard. And I've heard doctors and, you know, I've heard experts say that that I make the case that it's normal because of some of the events that happen during the uterus, you know, the contractions and the natural inflammation that happens with our period, that that's where the pain comes from. But I just want to put on record, and I'm sure many of your listeners might agree with this, but hopefully you agree that even though period pain is co- is common, it's not normal for the human body. And I think the, the normal experience of menstruation should not be painful. That doesn't mean that for those people who are experiencing a bit of pain here and there that, you know, it's something really bad or they're doing something wrong. It's just, I think I'd like to raise the bar of expectation around period pain. Mm-hmm. Well, and for yeah. the woman listening who has never experienced a period without pain or has very rarely experienced a, a period without pain, it can be a little strange hearing that. I think that yeah. there is a certain percentage of women that, that literally don't, they like, can't even imagine having a period that isn't painful. I don't know. Like yeah. you're right when you say like to raise the bar on that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I suppose where I'm going with this is 
So how would you describe what you would consider to be a normal experience of menstruation? Yeah, well, honestly, I think just a period, you know, a period that arrives with no symptoms, no, no warning, no, no significant PMS. You know, I think it's probably natural to feel if, if we're tuning in to the nuances of our body to feel a little bit different in terms of our appetite or energy or something like that, you know, that's probably, you know, to be expected, but essentially no symptoms, period arrives, no pain, just starts flowing, you know, flows for between sort of two to five days and then finishes and not too heavy, not losing more than about 80 milliliters of blood in the cycle. And that's, that's it. That's the end of the story. That's, you know, and coming every between 21 to 35 days with ovulation happening in their decent size, the teal phase leading up to the period. That's, I think that's a reasonable expectation for most women. You know, of course there are going to be exceptions. So we can talk about some of those today. And I'll just say right off the bat that obviously something, there's a condition called endometriosis that is called the condition of painful periods, but it's about a lot more than that. And I think you know, for someone with endometriosis, I don't know that, I think many of them can get to the place of no pain, but they, there's a different set of expectations when that disease is present. Well, so I, what we can, why don't we get into endometriosis a little bit, because those two topics are kind of connected. So if a woman has painful periods, does that mean that she likely has endometriosis? What's the connection there? Yeah, it's about degree of pain. So no, the majority of women who experience some period pain do not have endometriosis. And I, I have a, a blog, a post on my blog called When Period Pain is Not Normal. And basically I lay out this argument. It's like normal, you know, standard run-of-the-mill period pain should improve quite very quickly, I would say within a two or three cycles with natural intervention that we can talk about today. And then I state that if it doesn't improve, to me as a clinician, that's a sign that something else is going on, that it could be endometriosis. So that's kind of my test. The test currently is based, is, is the assessment of endometriosis currently is primarily done clinically, you know, asking patients about degree of pain and what other symptoms they might have that goes of endometriosis that goes along with that. And then ultimately that the current diagnosis is surgery, which is just crazy to me that it's 2017 and that's still what we're doing, but there's hope because there's been talk now for a few years, and I think maybe it's coming of a non-invasive test for endometriosis, which will either, I think be a saliva test or a blood test, which will just be a game changer for this condition. So it means if someone has severe period pain and they're wondering, they can, yeah, take that simple step of having the test and get an answer. Well, that's interesting. You know, my understanding of endometriosis was always that in order to get like a positive test you'd need to have laparoscopic surgery they'd have to go in yeah. and actually see if there's anything there yeah. so do you know how what the mechanism is that they're able to test with saliva or blood yeah so the saliva test they're calling it a micro rna test it's it's picking up some markers of the disease i don't know all the kind of biochemical details of that but it makes sense to me because it's an inflammatory disease it's the presence of there's something definitely going on in the body in terms of the immune system and abnormal tissue and you know it makes sense that that could be picked up that way but one thing to say is occasionally not routinely but occasionally endometriosis can be picked up with a specialized kind of ultrasound so and also some skilled gynecologists can palpate it can you actually feel it in the pelvis so there are you know I've certainly seen patients get to the point where their doctors were pretty sure that that's what's going on even before they do surgery. But for some women, no, it's like they really don't know until the surgeon goes in there, which is, yeah, obviously not ideal <laughs> to have to go straight to surgery. Although the way the doctors see it is, well, the surgery is the treatment as well. So we'll just do it all in one, you know, we'll diagnose and remove it and hopefully you know, cover all the bases that way. Mm -hmm. I read a statistic and uh, I also recorded a, an interview with Laura Owen, yep. which is not yet aired at the time yeah. of this recording, but it'll be airing soon. And so she mentioned the statistic, and I, I might not get it exactly right, but in the U.S. it takes something like 
somewhere between eight and 12 years between the U S and the UK. It takes somewhere between eight and 12 years between symptoms and diagnoses yeah. of uh, yeah. endometriosis. So maybe you could talk a little bit about the conventional approach to period pain and why conventional treatments are falling short and not really yeah. serving women. Oh, well, that's, yeah. I mean, it's almost no conventional treatment. We can say it in two words. It's painkillers and the pill. And I guess this kind of opens up a bit of a Pandora's box about, you know, how I feel about hormonal birth control and why that's a problem for women. But I'll give the very short version here, which is that it shuts down women's hormones. It shuts down everything that's happening with women cycling. And by doing that, it can suppress period pain. It doesn't always suppress the symptoms of endometriosis, by the way, but it certainly can. And so I think from the doctor's perspective, they have that tool. That's the tr that's going to be their prescription almost regardless of the diagnosis. So they just think, well, let's just go straight to the pill. And so, of course, that's why girls are put on the pill at 13 for period pain, which is very concerning. And there's that part of it that they, you know, have this tidy way of masking the symptoms. But also, I think, as we're seeing in some of the endometriosis awareness raising campaigns, there are a lot of myths and misunderstandings about endometriosis amongst doctors. For example, they think it doesn't happen. Some doctors think it doesn't happen in teenagers, which it totally does. They think period pain is normal, which it's Again, I would argue it's not. And of course, a young woman is going to really have no perspective, like no way of understanding is what, I, is what I'm experiencing within the realm of normal is this, or is there something really wrong? And they just get told again and again, this is just period pain. You have to just live with it, even though they're curled up in a ball on the, on the floor and crying and in agony every month. That's not even remotely in the realm of normal. Well, let's talk about the pain for a minute, because <laughs> there was this article that came out a little while ago, and it said doctors discover something like this, obviously I'm not quoting exactly, doctors discover that period pain is equal to the pain of a heart attack or something like that. Yes. You know, we knew this all along as women, and then this is news to everybody else. So yeah. especially being in my field and working intimately with so many women, specifically tracking and charting the menstrual cycle. I've heard a number of women describe their pain and what you mentioned initially was that we should expect that there's basically no pain in the cycle. How do we have this conversation? Like, how do we okay. tell, know what pain is unacceptable? Because I think you and I both okay. know that there are women who have like extreme excruciating, like crazy, crazy degrees of pain. And they actually just think that it's part of okay. being a woman. Yeah. So if someone's using the word like crazy or excruciating or straight away, I'm thinking about endometriosis. I'll be honest. It's, it's a common condition. It's one in 10 women. But let's break it down. Like I what I say in my book and how I describe it is this kind of run of the mill. I won't say normal, but common period pain, which looks like, you know, it's uncomfortable. It's definitely uncomfortable. Like you, you might want to kind of lie down. You might want a hot water bottle. You, you take a couple of, say, Advil or one Advil or two Advil, and that that gets rid of the pain. That's a test right there. It's like one of my test questions for my patients is, do painkillers work? For, like, does a standard, normal, just over-the-counter painkiller work for your period of pain? And if the answer is, yeah, it's fine, you know, I take the Advil and I'm fine, then I'm thinking, okay, that's pretty, that's sort of more the standard period pain. If someone's like, no, I take two Advil, and then four hours later, I take two more, and nothing touches it, okay, that's something different. So that's all right already um, a way to kind of quantify it, I guess. And another way would be, another question would be, does it interfere with your life? Like, can you still go to work? Can you still go to school? Or are you, is that it? Like, do you need two, two sick days for your period? As, when I, I saw that in the news recently too, about women being granted sick leave for their periods. And my view on that is, women should not require sick leave for their period. <laughs> you know, in terms of politically, like, uh, you know, I don't know, I guess if they want to do that, that's fine. But I'm just straight away, I'm thinking that is not, yeah, if a woman's reached the point where she can't work, then that something is going on. So, yeah. Well, and as a, this is probably a rabbit hole question, but I feel the need to ask it. As an aside, just what are your thoughts on like 
it's it's what you said. Women shouldn't require that. But yeah, what are your thoughts on why everyone seems to think it's totally normal for a woman to be in that much pain? I, I mean, I've been there. And so yeah. as someone now who's had two children, I can tell you that my period pain was worse than the first half of my labor. Like there was a Age. point where the labor crossed the threshold that the labor was actually more painful. But even with labor, labor comes in waves. So you have yeah. contractions and release and contraction and release. So it was actually easier for me to manage my labor pain than my period pain because the period pain just lasts all day. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be a more severe. And I assume... I, mean, I don't know if you want to say, but like, I assume this is, you don't have endometriosis. So what you're describing I don't, for I don't you, know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I don't have that type of pain anymore, but I had yeah. that level of pain for like a decade. That's one of the reasons why I do this, because I mean, everything I've learned has made such a prof- profound difference in my own life. Yeah. Well, one possibility, I'm just to raise, because endometriosis is extremely common and it, it is also possible, just possible that you did have some you know, that it was sort of active, but that all of your diet changes and everything and, you know, helped to improve that anyway. So I've certainly had women, women where I talked to them and I think, yeah, actually, I'm not sure what was going on back in your twenties. That sounded a little bit worrying, but whatever you've done has kind of really sorted it. So that's good news. Yeah. So the question, sorry, your question of you know, what to do about, what, what, are we sort of talking now about what to do about kind of period pain, how to get started? Oh, I know your question was, how do we, how have we come to think that that's kind of acceptable? Okay. Yeah. I heard this, I was speaking with a, a, pre- a clinician, another practitioner of acupuncture, Chinese medicine, and she made the statement, this is so, I'll just never forget this. She said that, yeah, some of her teachers of traditional Chinese medicine said, used to say, oh, it's so strange how you Western women think that periods should be painful. Because you know, I guess they're speaking from their culture, at least traditionally, that was never the case. I would argue that I do think, or you know, my perception would be that a big part of why it's so common amongst in our culture is diet and a few other factors, probably exposure to toxins and some things, a, com- a kind of a perfect storm of things going on that are have changed the the basic process of having a period. So, and I, and I would point to probably cow's dairy is a big part of that. Cause as, for example, in traditional Chinese culture, they, you know, they did not have dairy in their diet at all. And so I don't know if it's that simple, but that might, that's in my analysis, that's possibly a big part of what's going on. So I'd be interesting to see, you know, a survey of cultures around the world and how common period pain is just to give it a better perspective because we're just thinking within our own culture what you know happens so it sounds as though it's kind of like our culture has set up this situation where we're more likely to experience this pain and there therefore because it's so common we just assume that that means that this is how women are supposed to experience periods yeah exactly yeah this is our perspe- perception of normal but well yeah. in your res- how you were explaining just the different factors leads perfectly because i wanted to talk to you a little bit about what is behind it? Because ultimately, it's, it's helpful to hear, especially if you've been struggling with extreme pain for a long time. If you get a diagnosis of endometriosis, it's kind of like, okay, finally, there's a word I can name this thing that I've been experiencing. Now it's real. Now my doctor has to take me seriously. But yeah. ultimately, does that really tell us why you have it? What is the reason? What are some of the factors that and you talked about some of them? Maybe you could talk a little bit more about them. But what are some of the factors that lead to this pain and endometriosis ultimately? Yeah, look, I'd like to just start by, I don't see it as a gradation between sort of period pain and then worse and worse and eventually endometriosis. I think, I know that's kind of the way often, that's the way it feels. And that's certainly for some women, that seems to be what's going on. But I, I would, in my own thinking, I distinguish the two things as quite different. So a woman either has endometriosis or not. And because, it, you know, I think it's a very, specific kind of disease although there could be as i described you know in some case some cases where it seems to have improved on its own just with natural treatments which is great but the the mechanisms are different so in just normal period pain it's a lot to do with prostaglandins and i think histamine it's it's a kind of inflammatory reaction that stimulates the pain receptors with endometriosis there's a disease present i would argue well it's similar 
almost I'll say similar to auto different kinds of autoimmune disease. Like it's it's definitely some active tissue that's not supposed to be there that is involving whole aspects of the immune system and creating a different kind of inflammation that also causes pain. So I see them differently. And in, this is why I made the statement at the beginning that my experience is the kind of run of the mill period pain it improves quite quickly, like over a few cycles, whereas endometriosis pain is just by the nature of that it's a sort of disease tissue, if you will, that it can take it still can improve with natural treatments, but it usually t- typically takes a bit longer. And for some women might require additional treatment. And as to why endometriosis happens, there's a large genet- genetic component. I, I think the research is pretty clear on that combined with, again, kind of a perfect storm of, I think there seems to be evidence now that there has to be some probably dioxin exposure at some point in our lifespan, which even could include when we were in the, our mom's uterus. And then, you know, in combination with other factors, there's aspects going on with the immune system and the microbiome. And I hope that answers your question yeah, <laughs> about, about yeah. the two things. Yeah. yeah. Well, I like the way that you differentiated because I feel like I got a pretty clear picture in my mind. It sounds mm-hmm. like, so I'll just repeat it back to you and you can let me know, but it sounds yep. like with kind of what you call run-of-the-mill period pain. So the typical period pain that is not necessarily or not related to, like, so it's a totally separate thing. It's increased inflammation, increased activity, prostaglandins, and typically yeah. responds fairly fairly well to natural treatment. And, and quickly. Then, and quickly. Yeah. Whereas with endometriosis, yeah. because it's a disease process that's going on and there's disease tissue. So my understanding is with endometriosis, you have this endometrial tissue that's growing in other parts of like not where it's supposed to be growing. Obviously, total dysregulation of your immune system. If you have tissue growing in places, it's not supposed to grow. I did an interview with a surgeon, a napro surgeon, Kyle Biter, and it was really interesting because he showed pitch like he had on, on that page. So I'll link that page on that page. He actually, because he's a surgeon, he had images of like what it looks like. And I was yeah. a little bit surprised to see. Obviously, I, I don't, I'm not a surgeon. <laughs> yeah. So I've never, I'm never going to see endometriosis, but he, it it kind of it looked like kind of diseased tissue like it 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 kind of sometimes looked bumpy like almost like zits like bumpy yeah and sometimes it looked black so it's yep. this actual tissue that is then growing in other areas and then that process itself is what causes like more of a physical type of like obviously pain too but if you're rest- restricting motion and all that kind of stuff it's going to yep. cause a different type of pain yep. the, yeah yeah that could be pain can be in effect with the disease of endometriosis pain can be coming from all different Things. There's just the general inflammation that's part of what's happening with the lesions. The lesions themselves can start to cause pain. They can attach organs to each other, which can cause pain. And then after surgeries, you can, well, and also that's called adhesions. You can get that from the disease. You can get after the surgery for the disease, you can get more adhesions. You can get a whole sort of reactions going on with the nervous system just from having had that disease process there. So you can get kind of a chronic pain syndrome that way. So there's a lot to to it to endometriosis well and i think one thing that's really interesting is that not all women with endometriosis have pain no i know so then that's an important it's important that you made that distinction too between the pain and the endometriosis because endometriosis can be present without pain which is very interesting just depending on where it's located in the body i think depending on where it's located depending on the immune system just actually what is happening in that manifestation of the disease process yeah it's it's a complex disease i think anybody who speaks about endometriosis would have to use that word and it can mat- it can give other symptoms like it can just give you know i've had some patients where their only symptom is is flooding heavy periods and clots or for example one patient who her only symptom was this chronic kind of what her doctors were thinking were recurring bladder infections or sort of a cystitis but turned out to be there was endometriosis on her, her urethra and bladder. It can cause pain with sex, and maybe that's the only symptom. It can cause kind of a bloated, constant bloated feeling and pain even just with walking or digestive symptoms, or, you know, it's as you can see, it's a, yeah, there's a lot to it. When it's, and yet at the same time, you can have women who have it quite mildly and didn't amount to much, and they were able to kind of put it into a remission, if you will, which is what I talked about earlier, like just sort of calm it all down. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. (laughs) 
Well, so for the woman listening then who has period pain of some kind, of some degree, so maybe we could talk about different ways of addressing these things. And I'm not sure if you want to talk about them together or separately, but how do you, what are some of the ways that you approach? Because it sounds like it's complicated. Yep. And I know a lot of women yeah. want to have the like, okay, so you just go and take okay. this. Well, the fir- <laughs> I have a float. I have a flow chart going. So the first part of the flow chart is not complicated. And this is the flow chart I kind of referred to earlier when I said I treat, you know, treat period pain. And then if it doesn't respond the way I expect within a few months, then I'm thinking, okay, maybe there's something else going on. Maybe this could be endometriosis or another condition called adenomyosis, which is kind of similar to endometriosis, but is more to do with just abnormal tissue within the uterine wall. So, but let's start with the beginning of the flow chart, especially let's just start with an example of a teenager, or it could be an older woman, but let's just say a teen who's got pretty bad pain and is about to go on the pill and her mom brings her, is like, no, let's just try, let's keep this simple because she's a teenager, you know, she's not gonna wanna do too many supplements or too much complication. So. In my thinking, number one is get off cow's dairy. And there may be exceptions to this, but I've really yet to see one. <laughs> like it pretty much <laughs> seems to be almost everyone. So that, that means no normal yogurt or milk or cheese or ice cream or, um, and not, it's not forever, but what I'm, how I'm framing it, especially in this situation might be, let's just do this for a few months, see where we can get. And then going forward in her life, you know, she can decide how much dairy she can tolerate but in my experience she can still have goat or sheep products and the reason is because they have a different casein they have a different protein I think that's the reason they just do not seem to cause period pain the way cow's dairy does and they can have butter she can have butter because there's almost none of the inflammatory casein or protein in that so for most of my patients at least down here in Sydney Australia that's that's easy. There's so many products now. Like 20 years ago when I was doing this, this was a big problem for patients. But now it's like, oh, I can get coconut yogurt. I can get goat cheese. I can, you know, this is easy. I've got it all figured out. So most people are pretty happy with that. Well, is it I the same? Just, yeah. Can I ask you for a second? Because I know yeah. in your book, you, you actually make that distinction between A1 and A2 dairy, the the different types of protein. And yep. I think that it's, it's, still, it's still challenging first because, I mean... I feel like I'm one of the unicorns that has access to A2 dairy. Yeah. Um, Because I source my the milk from my family from it's a whole it's a whole conversation. Oh, yeah, source, so you, got, you have access to Jersey cows over uh, Guernsey. Oh, which yeah, essentially yeah, the same thing. Great. Guernsey or Jersey, yeah. So, but it's 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 not it's just yeah. So there's I think it's helpful because I I feel like there's so many sources out there that say like all oh, milk is bad forever, but I really like that you make that distinction that. It's this. It's not necessarily "quote unquote" milk as a concept, but there's specific proteins and pretty much all of the tradition, all the all of the milk that we have available to us commercially. But it's helpful to at least know if someone does want alternatives like goat, sheep, and if you are a unicorn like me and have access to yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. milk from Jersey or Guernsey cows that actually don't have that A1 beta casein that seems to cause all these different problems. Yeah. And in fact, just to point out that the A1, the cows with the A1 casein are pretty new in the world. You know, up until I think a few hundred years ago, they just didn't exist at all. So most of traditional peoples and still even today, most people, the majority of people in the world are obtaining their milk from A2 cows. So that just gives it broader perspective that certainly we can see that dairy has been a food for many traditional cultures. And so kind of makes sense to me that it, they would have been eating a non-inflammatory dairy. So there's more about that in my book and there's different people writing about that, talking about that. And it, you're right, it does make it a lot easier going forward. And also I'll say for some of these, this example of the teen who's just got some peer, bad, reasonably bad period pain, this may not be a lifelong thing anyway. Like she may kind of outgrow it. So it might be that she can eventually go back to having, if she needs to, for whatever reason, go back to having the occasional normal dairy. Although we don't, one thing to say here is actually that this is pretty clear now from a paper that came out of Harvard a few years ago, which I love to quote. I think I quote it twice in my book that basically they made the statement that the human humans have no nutritional requirement for animal milk. 
So obviously as humans, we have nutritional requirement for human milk when we're babies, but beyond that, we don't really, it's not a food group, if you will. <laughs> so <laughs> it's enjoyable though. And I eat, I eat A2 dairy as well. So I'm not saying people can definitely have it if, you know, have dairy, if they can tolerate it. So, so that's my number one treatment, but I often will do that together with a couple of supplements just to get the full rapid relief that I'm expecting. The, the next thing is zinc. And there was interesting scientific paper put out of Australia actually a couple of years ago giving zinc supplements to teenagers instead of the pill for period pain. They did them kind of, you know, as a clinical trial where they kind of did them face to face or which, which works best and um, head to head. And the zinc came out. I think what they concluded was the zinc did as well as the pill. And then they said, they said this funny thing in the paper, we're like, and the zinc is a lot more cost effective. So therefore we recommend it. I'm like, okay, okay. Yeah, it's, wow. cost effective. it's cost effective, but also there's the fact that it doesn't castrate these teenage girls of their own hormones, but that's, anyway, that's another. <laughs> that oh. oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it, so pay, you know, parents and could be confident that and zinc is safe for, it's a safe supplement. It truly is. The only thing about zinc is it really needs to be taken after food or it can make anyone feel nauseated or sick to the stomach. So a simple zinc supplement. And then I'll often also give turmeric as a capsule, as a, there's some excellent turmeric supplements out there. And those kind of three things, dairy-free, zinc, and turmeric, and as I say in my blog post as well, um, one period is called, the blog post is called when period pain is not normal. I lay that out as you know, do those and let's see where we get in the next couple cycles and that, you know, what percentage better is she? And then we can decide what that comes next. Yeah. Well, and this approach is essentially targeting like the, the problem <laughs> because yeah. targeting the inflammation, the problem of inflammation. So eliminating the, the dairy is a way to yeah. reduce inflammation because obviously in case you had yeah. heard, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. conventional dairy is pretty inflammatory. And then the zinc and the turmeric also address yep. inflammation specifically. So it's like addressing the root of the problem in a way. Yeah, it all it dials down the prostaglandins and that, you know, that inflammation. Yeah, it's um it's quite simple. While we're on the topic of reducing inflammation, we'll just say for the record, there are a couple of other common techniques that are, you know that women have said to, that I recommend, that I say in my book, and that I've certainly had some feedback from women. One is um if possible, to dial back the, veg the vegetable oils, like the seed oils. I think, Henry, even you saying that at one point, Lisa, but like, yeah, just kind of switching over to coconut oil and butter and olive oil and getting away from some of the, well, all the, you know, obviously getting rid of deep fried and any foods that have a high omega-6 content. And that seems to make a big difference. Would you still agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, the more that it's like the more that you learn about those fats and how they're processed, it, it takes a Herculean effort to create those industrial seed oils. And yeah. so by the time you get them in your house, they're already damaged. And then as soon as you start cooking them with them, they start to smoke. They're just yep. not. And then your cells integrate that into the cell wall. Sure. It's well, they're certainly the yeah, the damaged oil, certainly when seed oils become damaged, when the polyunsaturated oil is damaged, that's a problem. But even before that, actually, it's just, it's a lot to do with something called omega-6 mm -hmm. versus omega-3 ratio. And even just, even having non-damaged seed oil at a certain point with grains and seeds, and if that's mainly where the, the essential fatty acids are coming from, that's going to be an, an omega-6 dominant situation. And that promotes more prostaglandins more of these sort of inflammatory prostaglandins. So it is important to get some of those oh, either omega-3, well, and definitely we need omega-3 oils, but also just some of the polyunsaturated and saturated fat to make up a big part of our diet. So to dial back the omega-6. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. And then the other thing I'll mention, I, this is new in the second edition of my book. I did talk a little bit about histamine intolerance, which just a situation, different foods can flare up histamine in the body. And that does, so that would include, well, that includes dairy. That's a big one. That could be one of the reasons dairy, coming off dairy helps so much. But even just some of the high dose of fermented foods or kind of tin canned fish or 
certain meats like preserved meats and things like that can and red wine and you know these are all things that increase the amount of histamine in the body and that does seem to for some for some women not everyone but some for some women that translates into more pms and more period pain well can you take a moment and just share with us more so when i hear histamine i think like antihistamine and i think allergies yeah um, maybe you can share with us just what break it down for us like what is a histamine and why are these foods causing an increase of that yeah so histamine is a normal part of our body obviously it's actually quite an important signaling molecule almost like a hormone um it's involved in it's deeply involved in female reproduction which is interesting and the whole ovulation signaling uses histamine so it kind of makes sense to me now a bit more now why histamine intolerance is overlapping so much with women's health but yeah, too much. His- so normally we just have to have, we want a sweet spot, right? We want just the right amount for our immune and our hormonal signaling. And if we get too much, then that starts to cause problems because histamine is also, a, a, in addition to its many other jobs, it's a neurotransmitter. So it can cause, you know, anxiety and sort of this feeling of being overstimulated. It, our body makes it, and our immune system makes it. And under certain stimuli, it's going to make more that would include allergies being exposed to an allergen but also just certain foods like dairy cow's dairy cause in many people a um, a part of the immune system called the mast cells to release a lot more histamine than would be acceptable and then on top of that there is the fact that some foods just actually contain histamine for many of the foods especially things like preserved meats and cheeses and things like that it's from the bacteria in the food has made it's created more histamine. So just in, ingesting those can up the total amount of histamine and kind of put people over the edge in terms of symptoms. And at the same time, we have all these mechanisms to try to, to, to normally clear histamine from the body. And those enzymes that do that require, for example, vitamin B6 to work, which I think is one of the reasons why vitamin B6 gives such rapid relief to PMS, for example, if there's a histamine component, PMS. And the other thing that helps to upregulate the histamine clearing enzymes is, wait for it, drum roll, progesterone. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> progesterone is, actually helps to reduce histamine sensitivity, histamine intolerance. So again, I, I think I stay up in my book that I think this histamine side of things is one of the reasons that both vitamin B6 and progesterone are so soothing and calming and helpful for PMS. Hmm. It was so interesting because when you, you know, in my line of work, I see a lot of menstrual cycle charts. And so, you know, you can kind of see in real time how different foods affect the cycle. And so food intolerances are really, if you have an intolerance to something kind of like whether you know about it or not, and you consume those foods as someone who reads charts, like you can see that kind of stuff show up in different ways for different women. And then when they, if they, if they experiment with removing certain things or putting them back, then you, you see how their chart responds to it. And uh, so it's just very interesting to to think about how all these pieces fit together and how, because women's menstrual cycles are very susceptible to food intolerances. It's very, very like it's when you, when you're watching cervical mucus patterns and temperature patterns, like it's actually, I think it's, it's very kind of surprising, like not kind of surprising, extremely surprising for a lot of women when they start to chart, how sensitive their cycles are to that. That is so interesting. You should, have you already done a podcast on that topic? Cause I would love to listen to that one. No um, way. Not specifically <laughs> kind of comes up yeah. here and there. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it. I totally believe it in terms of cervical mucus and, and temperatures, general temperatures. I would think, I'm just curious on this topic or diverging a little bit here, but would you see, because I would expect somewhat of a bit of a lag time or a delay in terms of the charting, just because of the way inflammation affects ovulation, I think that's potentially going to be earlier in the follicles journey to ovulation. And so potentially, certainly what I see with my own patients, if they remove wheat, say, for example, which can have a big effect on ovulation, I might say to them, you can expect a better luteal phase in two or three cycles from now, once your follicles have had a chance to get really happy about the new situation. Would you do you observe something like that with your own clients? Yeah, I would say that certain things, it depends on what it is. I always say if, you, if you've if you hit the nail on the hammer. So for instance, yeah. when I have clients who have like kind of significant gut challenges where it's 
pretty clear that there are some food sensitivity issues at play. I've seen charts where the mucus patterns specifically quite abruptly shift from one cycle yeah. to another. So it's clear that whatever you've done has made it an impact. Yeah. But that's not to say that you go from like a chart that's like super outside of the normal parameters to totally normal. Yeah. And so I would agree with you. So I typically encourage my clients to think in terms of cycles of three, where when yes. you make certain changes, like let's keep at it. And typically we see some kind of improvements along the way, but you can't really make a definitive judgment if this is really, if we've really got it until we see a couple of cycles. Cycles of three. That's exactly, that's the hundred days to ovulation that I talk about in my book. So yeah. yeah. Great. And it's really, it's hard, right? Because then you have a client who's monitoring their information every day. And obviously you're not going to see <laughs> a, a huge shift between Tuesday and Wednesday. And so that's no. where, you, you know, that's where you come in handy to kind of when they come in for that three month appointment to remind them, okay, well, when you came to see me first, <laughs> this yeah. is what we were dealing with. So yeah. although you didn't make a lot of progress this week, or you don't feel like yeah. you did, like the look at what we're look at where we started from type of thing. Yeah. And I'll give expectations. Often I'll say something like, depending on where they are in their cycle at the time of our appointment, I'll say, look, this next period coming up, I have no idea what's going to happen. Like you could have as much pain or like I just it's too there isn't enough time yet. We're gonna what we're expecting is probably two cycles from now. That's when you're going to start to see the real benefits. And it's really helpful for women to have, yeah, that kind of arc of time, you know, to, expectation of how this is all going to play out yeah yeah so important because then yeah when you set the expectation and then if something happens to happen a little bit sooner then it's yeah that's good a nice surprise yeah, yeah. so th I, I really appreciate how you've taken us through just basically how to manage painful periods and my question is when you're dealing with endometriosis or adenomyosis as you talked about your flow chart are there additional steps or are there additional parts of this picture that that you would go through with your with your patients yes yes so then it becomes now it it's not a simple flow chart anymore now it really starts to open up in terms of okay let's start to put some options on the table what are all the different options and what decisions are we going to make about what which ones you try honestly there are probably i'd say i'm um, all in the back of my mind i've got sort of eight or ten different possible treatments for endometriosis, including surgery is on the table. So I'm not saying every woman who suspects endometriosis rushes out and does that, but depending on the level of distress and what is going on, I might earlier rather than later say, okay, I think actually you should see a gynecologist who understands, so first of all, get the name of a gynecologist who understands endometriosis and who, if you were to have surgery, is going to do it properly, something, properly, something called excision surgery, which I do think the evidence is building is probably the better method and at least have a meeting with the gynecologist. Maybe she can do a, a physical exam, order the special kind of ultrasound, get started just thinking about what's going on. And at the same time that that's happening, we're going to now start to bring in some other dietary changes and some other supplements. And so because endometriosis potentially is in the same, at least the same area as autoimmune disease. It's a controversial statement to say it's autoimmune disease. So I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's it's in the it's similar in that territory. I will start to look at all my protocols for that. And that now that starts to become, okay, you may need we need, we need to think about strictly avoiding gluten. Gluten upsets the immune system very much and is often a drug not a cause, but like a worsening factor for many kinds of inflammatory disease, including endometriosis. I might look at other common food sensitivities or immune disruptors like eggs, which is funny because I just did a little Instagram post about eggs, which got a great, so many people chiming in about how eggs affects their immune system. I love eggs as a food. I'm a huge, huge fan. They're almost the perfect food, but they unfortunately for about, I'd estimate about one in 15 women are, you know, can affect disrupt immune function, one in 15 people. So that I might start thinking about that. I might start looking at other supplements. A big one I'm using these days is something called N-acetylcysteine or NAC, which actually had a clinic, it underwent a clinical trial, which I, I reference this in my book. They, 
the researchers, it's funny reading the paper because they were so over the moon. They just, they couldn't believe it, like how well this supplement did for endometriosis. And a couple of, some of the participants in the study actually had, for example, something called endometrioma is like a large kind of mass of endometriosis that forms on the ovaries. And they, some of those disappeared on ultrasound for some of their patients. <laughs> and the N-acetylcysteine? Or yeah, the N-acetylcysteine. The N-acetylcysteine. And then some of their their participants fell pregnant, like became pregnant. And it was just like, you know, they were just, just pretty enthusiastic about this supplement. Wow. So not to overstate it, but, you know, I do think it's quite a helpful supplement. And I think it needs to be done in combination with all the dietary and the other things that I've talked about. But definitely zinc and dairy. For endometriosis, zinc, dairy are still there. Turmeric is probably still there. And then I just start to bring in other things. I might look at using probiotics to, to help to modulate the immune system and maybe the disease process and selenium, things like that. Well, and one of the things that you mentioned towards the beginning of the interview was, I, I won't quote exactly what you said, of course, but it was just a note that most of the time it's just straight to surgery in the, the conventional yeah, system. Yeah, conventional, yep. And so maybe you could talk a little bit about that. So you mentioned surgeries on the table, but of course, with your with your patients, you are looking at this other approach. So we're obviously not going straight into anything. Like we're basically yep. starting at the beginning and kind of working yep. through these protocols and really giving an opportunity to see what's going to work for what woman and starting gently in a way and then moving yep. crescendoing yep. slowly. Yeah. So I just love to hear your thoughts on, on this yep. approach and also how... So when all of the patients that you've kind of worked with over the years, when you take them through this, give us a sense of how common is it then for your patients then to need surgery afterwards? You know what I mean? Like yeah. how, as they go through these different alternatives. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. So if I'm, I've already gone through the flow chart of, okay, this is probably not normal period pain. We're dealing with something else here. I, I Early on in the flow chart, I would say, it, I think at least get the opinion of a gynecologist. You don't have to I mean, you can speak to a gynecologist and have a physical exam and you don't have to commit to surgery straight away, even if they want you to. And the, and I'm hoping that soon at that early stage we'll be, okay, have the non-invasive saliva or blood test, which has hopefully become available <laughs> very soon. And then I'll say, okay, so but let's, let's get started on the treatment. And I think there's, I would say to my patients, I think there's a 50% chance, I guess I'd say 50% chance this is going to just really resolve things and if essentially if she can get to the point of and I'll say the goal post is no pain or nearly no pain so the pain is our marker for most women although if it's heavy periods or bladder symptoms then that's our whatever the, the symptom whatever the marker is and then let's see if we can get you there in the next say five to six months like approaching no symptoms and yeah, if you reach, essentially, if a woman's reached the point of no symptoms, then she doesn't require surgery unless, the big except here, the big unless is unless she's trying for pregnancy, in which case even symptomless endometriosis can interfere with fertility. So then, so then the goalpost might be, okay, no symptoms and you manage to become pregnant, or but if not, then... Yeah, there might, at least at this stage in, you know, our understanding and approach to endometriosis, there might, there is an argument for having the surgery to improve fertility. And I certainly let my patients know about that. I want them to, I don't want them to just go along thinking, like they might, they might very well might become pregnant just with the natural treatments. And, but as long as they know that the surgery can also, has been shown to pretty dramatically improve fertility amongst endometriosis sufferers so mm -hmm. I guess that would be my yeah yeah sort of, yeah well that gives us a good idea and I think yeah I, I, I would feel like as a woman I would appreciate having the surgery be more of a last resort type of option yeah for sure I feel like yeah. even if I ended up needing surgery like I'm just it's just I'm just kind of hypothetically this out but even if I was in a situation like that and I ended up needing surgery I would feel more just, I don't know, more comfortable knowing that I did everything I could. Absolutely. Well, and the other way to think about it is actually re doing all the natural treatments, reducing the inflammation and the disease process as much as possible before surgery is going to make the surgery more successful because there'll be less disease tissue there to deal with and the surgeon can probably do a better job. That's kind of how I see it. You know, this, this really 
every reason to try to improve the disease process as much as possible, regardless of whether surgery might eventually happen or not. And I guess on the topic, we sh I should give one other treatment here. So I do think, especially for more severe cases of endometriosis or the other condition, adenomyosis, I recommend sometimes a, progest a natural progesterone capsule, which I would see could potentially be used in place of some of the progestin drugs or some of the hormonal drugs that doctors are trying to use for the condition. I find it works. Well, I find it works as well and doesn't have all the side effects actually has some, you get some of the benefits of, a, of actual natural progesterone. So that's another thing that could be on the table for now we're talking about yeah, endometriosis and adenomyosis. I wouldn't put natural progesterone necessarily on the table straight away for normal period pain, although some women do use it and get results from that. And could you, do you know the relationship there? How, why is progesterone helpful for endometriosis and pain? Yeah, well, it, it just, it, it down regulates the prostaglandins. Like I said, it would be for normal period pain. Right. Yeah. But it, in terms of endometriosis, it's, it's very likely actually helping the lesions themselves. So they, because the lesion, the, the endometriosis lesions are very hormone sensitive, just as our normal uterine lining is so they're stimulated by estrogen and then they're kind of they're down regulated or calmed down by progesterone so although there is a degree of what's called progesterone resistance within the lesions which is, makes it more complicated but the idea is you try to overcome that resistance by a higher dose of progesterone and try to arguably shrink the lesions one what are your thoughts on um like acupuncture and also abdominal therapy type treatments yeah. for pain and things like that. What are your thoughts on those? Yeah, I'm for it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm for, I think, yeah, that's always a whole nother podcast, but yes, I think for both, for both just kind of run of the mill period pain could be helpful. And also for endometriosis. I mean, there's people, therapists who specialize in different types of pelvic therapy for endometriosis and especially helping with adhesions and things like that. I think, yes, I think there's definitely a place for that. Uh, absolutely. And I think, also, just on the topic of endometriosis, there's something called a castor oil pack, which I do find, I, rec I do prescribe. That's using a topical applied with heat, just some castor oil to the skin, which absorbs through the skin into the pelvis and can help to stimulate the immune system to clear up some of that inflammation, potentially. Well, it's so, you know, I really appreciate having conversations like these. I, I really feel like it's a, it's a scenario of women helping other women. Often women who are struggling with period pain struggle for years and just trying to, and then using treatments that just address the pain in the, in the moment, but don't really see yeah. any everlasting change. <laughs> and they feel trapped on the pill too. Like they'll, they'll be like, well, I, ha I have to take the pill because I have all this terrible pain. It's like, well, that's basically closed the door. The door is closed for them to have their experience, their own hormonal cycling to ever chart or all these things, which is, makes me sad. So this is about, this is a lot about breaking the silence too around period pain and just really trying to get the message out there. It is not normal to be in pain. You do, you do not, you can expect much better from your body than that. And there's, there's going to be a solution of some kind. Hopefully it's one of the natural treatments that I've talked about. But if, if part of that solution means finding the right surgeon and eventually, you know, as, that would, as I agree with you, that should be kind of a last resort, but at least knowing that that's in my thinking, you know, at, having a properly done surgery is better than being in agony every month and being trapped on hormonal birth control and using painkillers. Like, you know, obviously I just, in the big picture, I think that there has to be a way out. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think a big piece of this is advocating for yourself. And that's, yeah. that's the hard part because I know I'm not a lot like there's so many women who've experienced going to their primary care physician and asking questions about their pain and if there's anything that they can do to reduce it and being told that there's not being told yeah. that there's no nothing that you can do this is just how it is and dietary changes don't work I've <laughs> spoken to women That's a, yeah. who told me things like that right that their doctors tell them so it's hard to it's hard especially if you've had that experience because that has a lot of weight coming from a medical professional Doctors should not be saying that. You know, I, I know they. I know why they are saying it because I guess in their toolbox they don't have a lot to offer. But it is, yeah, th there are solutions, and diet does help, absolutely. So, uh, yeah. yeah. 
<sighs> well, I think that's <laughs> probably a good because yeah, I mean, you and I feel like you and I, um, <laughs> we should, yeah. we share a lot of the same angsts about these things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah sure. um, well, you know, we've talked about so many different things. I really appreciate your insights. And I'm really excited to share this episode with my audience, because uh, especially for the listeners who are experiencing period pain, there's just so many different options and alternatives that that you've presented here today. It just really gives you a place to start from. And if nothing more, it also gives hope. Absolutely. Yeah, a lifeline, like a little life preserver. Yeah. <laughs> You're yeah. not alone. There's things no. To do. <laughs> and so yeah. uh, what, is, what is the big, one kind of big thing or one main takeaway that you'd want our listeners to take from our conversation? Yeah, I guess it's just that, that, that the, 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 I guess I want to say too that your your body is not as complicated as you think. You know, there there, <laughs> it responds to things. It wants to be healthy. There is a way. And you know, I've had a few people just comment about my book, which I'm happy about. Is that wow, this is a lot simpler than I thought. We've we've kind of had this, and this I think this comes from our patriarchy, I would say. But this just kind of mythology that oh, the woman's body is so complicated, and oh, there's just so much to it, and really don't try to understand it to leave that in the realm of the doctors and yeah so work like what you do and what I do is just as you use the word empowering empowering women to understand that it's not that complicated (laughs) it's doable yeah (laughs) yeah there's kind of these basic these fundamentals yeah and if we focus on the fundamentals a lot of the other things fall into place yeah absolutely our period is our monthly report card which is on a day-to-day for most of us that's a pretty workable analogy i will just give one little caveat about that but saying it doesn't mean that if you have endometriosis that you've done something wrong because that disease is coming i think from our industrial society but at least even know that even if you have something like endometriosis there's usually a way out mm-hmm. i like to think of it like your body can't talk to you in words so your body can't be like hey i've got this yeah. problem so th- your body has to find other ways to communicate with you Absolutely. It talks to us by our cycles, it talks to us by our periods, by our temperatures, you know, by charting. It's, yeah, it's good. Yeah. Well, so for the listeners who are really excited and want to check out your book and find out more about you and what you do, where can they go for that? Yep. So I'm at larabryden.com. That's my blog, my hormone blog, and everything from there. You can link to Instagram at Lara Bryden, Facebook at Lara Bryden's Healthy Hormone Blog. And my book is Period Repair Manual, and it's on Amazon and iTunes and all the normal places. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being here, Laura. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode at fertilityfriday.com slash 180. I hope that you enjoyed my interview with Dr. Bryden today. It was so nice to have her on the show and it was a really great opportunity to go into some ways to address period pain and some of the reasons behind it and to have that candid conversation about the relationship between painful periods and and endometriosis and adenomyosis and just to really have a, a deeper understanding. You know, so many of the women that I work with are told by their physicians that there's nothing that they can do about the pain or that painkillers are the only option. And as Dr. Bryden mentioned, sometimes the painkillers aren't enough. So sometimes over-the-counter painkillers don't even touch the pain for some women. And so really having a deeper understanding of what are some of the factors that contribute to this, how to minimize those, and also some of the ways to reduce inflammation and to reduce the pain. And even just to give that hope, there's a lot of things that you can do. It's obviously complicated and involved. It's not just one simple solution to everything. And of course, as a reminder, the information presented in the podcast is not intended to replace medical advice. And ultimately, you will get the best results when you are working with a skilled practitioner, especially if you find yourself experiencing severe pain. And I've done a number of episodes on endometriosis, and I've done a few episodes with regards to painful periods. And I think one of the, the interesting parts of the process that I think it was the interview that I did with Shauna DeRue. So this is going back to episode 17, I think it is. And I remember that one of the things that she talked about was that it's not when she has a a patient that has experienced significant pain for a number of years, often if, and, and the patient is currently on hormonal contraceptives as a way to manage that pain, 
one of her suggestions was not to just immediately go off of them, but to start kind of start working the program. <laughs> so start making some of these changes. So she talked about how she works with her clients for a period of time, especially in those cases where the pain is severe, such that by the time they stop taking hormonal contraceptives, the goal would be to, to not have it just be as dramatic and drastic introduction back to the pain. And so I, I think that it's important not to minimize the degree of the pain. And it's not to say that, I, I mean, ultimately when it comes down to it, if you're in that much pain, you really need to do something about it. I think what's helpful about this type of approach is that it's really aimed at getting to the root of the situation, looking at what is actually causing it. And you're going for something that can give you lasting results. So for any of you who have painful periods and who've relied on painkillers, you know that those painkillers just work in the moment. And so what I found was frustrating about having to rely on painkillers is that they were effective to some degree sometimes. <laughs> so sometimes they worked and sometimes they didn't, depending on how quickly we get them. So anyone who knows about the window, like if you don't take the drugs in the window, then they don't work. But regardless of that, what I found most frustrating was that every cycle, the pain comes back or after the, the four or six hours or whatever passes, the pain comes back. So with painkillers, it's this very temporary solution and it's obviously not addressing any of the reasons why the pain is there and it's something that you have to continue to take so when you rely on painkillers for the pain it's like you literally just have to just continue to take them because you haven't really addressed the problem and so that's what I really appreciate about this episode here. And so for those of you who are interested in uh, Laura's work, I would definitely suggest to take a look at her book, Period Repair Manual. As I mentioned at the top of the podcast, it is a really great resource to have. And as she mentioned, her newest edition has included different references and resources. So I think you'll find it to be very useful and very helpful, especially if you're struggling with issues of period pain or otherwise. And so just as a reminder for you, if you haven't had an opportunity yet to jump in and grab your copy of my free video series, my FAM 101 video series, make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash FAM 101, that's F-A-M 101, to sign up for your copy of my free video series. So there's three videos in the series, and when you sign up, you'll actually get an email each day with the next day. <laughs> so the, when you sign up, you get the first video, and then the following day, you'll get the second, and then the third will come the day after. And if you're looking for support in your fertility awareness journey, so wherever you are on that path, whether you're brand new to this method and you just want to make sure that you are 100% confident in using it correctly, or whether you are an experienced charter and you've been charting your cycles for a while, but you're finding that you're having some challenges interpreting your charts or even with some of the charting specific. So I know a lot of women come to me with questions about cervical mucus, basal body temperature. I think those are two of the most confusing aspects. And then of course, cervical position. So if you're having challenges just with the nuances of it so that you can really move from move to feeling more confident about it, I would invite you to take a look at the different programs I offer. So make sure to head over to fertilityfriday.com slash work with me for more information. And of course, I want to thank you for hanging out with me today, for listening and uh, to today's episode and supporting the show. And I really appreciate all of you for listening to the show, supporting the show, and also sharing the show with your friends. And so if you find a particular episode powerful, helpful, or if someone comes to mind, someone who's been struggling with a particular issue, and you're listening to an episode and you're thinking of that per that person, oh, I wish, you know, I know she would really find this to be useful, then I would encourage you to to share and to keep doing that because that is how the, the show grows. That's how the show expands. That's how it reaches new listeners and ultimately my goal with the show is to share with as many women as possible how does your menstrual cycle work how is your menstrual cycle connected to your overall health because obviously this isn't something that we're being taught in schools and so we kind of have to take it upon ourselves to to learn it and also to share it with other women so i appreciate all of you for being part of this process being part of this movement and uh, we'll be talking about period pain and and I'll be posting a topic in the Fertility Friday Facebook community. So if you're not in the Facebook community as of yet, you can head over to fertilityfriday.com community. And uh, when you head over to that link, you'll be 
redirected to the Facebook group. And so we'll actually be talking about this episode in there once it's released. And we'll be talking about what what you have done. So trying to get a sense of what other women in the group have done to address period pain, whether they're still experiencing it, whether they found a way to overcome the pain. So we'll be having some great discussions in there. And I'd love to have you uh, in there too, to talk about this. So we'll see you over in the Facebook community. And so as always, be well and happy charting. Happy charting.